lots of money into the local economies. They wanted some senators wanted assurance that when the federal monies came in to local governments that they weren't paying uh, subsistence wages only with the, with the federal money. And the Davis and the Bacon are the names of a senator and a congressman that passed legislation. And when we refer to Davis Bacon uh, or prevailing wages, it's actually a collection of various federal acts, including the Davis Bacon Act, the Copeland Act, and the Contract Work Hour and Safety Acts. It is important that you or someone at your entity know it because, as I mentioned, it can result in uh, lawsuits. There are truly quite a few federal lawsuits where a contractor disagrees with the determination or the government sues the contractor because they didn't follow it. So it is important stuff. It is federal, so with apologies, it's laborious and sort of long. When they enacted the Davis-Bacon Related Acts in 1931, they set the threshold at $2,000. 80 something, 90 something years later, it's still $2,000. Uh, it has never been adjusted for inflation. So any project using a penny of federal funds, and we'll talk about that later, but if it has a penny of federal funds in it, and it exceeds $2,000, and it involves construction, major renovation, and generally major maintenance, Davis-Bacon and the related acts apply. By the way, feel free to put questions in chat or to, to voice them. This works a lot better if you interact with me. Um, but those are the general times it applies. Like everything else federal, there are exceptions. Generally, under ARPA, the most recent big federal program, it doesn't generally is not required unless it's over $10 million and it's for infrastructure. The federal government highly recommends it. But your typical CDBG grants, um, the block grants that it applies, if you get a, other kinds of grants, it almost always applies. It is important to note that the prevailing wages only apply to laborers and mechanics whose duties are manual or physical. If they are a supervisor, and there's a definition of what supervisor means, but if they are a supervisor, a non-working foreman type, for instance, you do not have to track their wages and their hours. And interestingly, even though it says it's construction, renovation, and for laborers and mechanics, it can typically include alterations, painting, and decorating, uh, which is an interesting jump to me. And demolition is an interesting exception. Um, the, the feds change the rules, modify the rules over time. And in the 80s, I think it was, or early 90s maybe, they started exempting demolition from prevailing wages provided that you're not intending to immediately rebuild there. So if you had a school, for instance, Lori, and you were going to demolish it and had no immediate plans to put anything else back there, the demolition would not include Davis-Bacon. On the other hand, if you were going to build a new school as soon as you demolished it, it would include Davis-Bacon. And landscaping is another one of those odd ones. It's covered only if it's part of construction or renovation. It is really important to know that it does apply whether or not the entire project is funded with federal funds. My silly example is that if you are going to have a $10 million project and $1 is federal funds and 9,999,000 is local or state funds, the federal rules still apply. And if your state happens to have prevailing wage laws of its own, by the way, the federal ones trump. Also, an interesting thing that's been asked through the years, does it apply to the entire project if we're only using federal funds 
to pave the new school's parking lot or to put in elevators? The answer is yes. It applies to the entire project because you're using federal funds for some portion of it. And Lori, yes, go ahead. I was going to say there is a question, but whenever you're ready. Go, go ahead. I was just actually going to say, Lori or Camille, tell me if there's questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, what about Head Start ARP funds? We have not received any communication about flexibility from the Office of Head Start. So um, the guidance so far from, and I'm not involved with Head Start, so I, you know, but the general guidance from ARPA, the United States Department of Treasury about ARPA funds is that they highly recommend using prevailing wages or something similar if it's for infrastructure over $10 million. That appears to be one of their things they will probably audit. Um, and you can, there's an FAQ online, and I actually have a copy if you want it, just email me and I'll send it to you. But there's an FAQ and they detail their expectations. That also is a great segue to say, and Penny and um, a woman from Arkansas and I did a, a webinar, I think Monday for NIGP. One of the things we mentioned then, and I'll mention here is, it is very important to chat with whoever the grant is coming from. All granting agencies have different expectations, different interpretations, and different twists. Um, I think I saw Michael Giles is on here from the uh, airport, Knoxville Airport. So they get a lot of funds from the Federal Department of Transportation. And much like the Housing and Urban De Development Department, the Department of Transportation uh, has different regions. Um, I'm not sure what region the Knoxville area is, but let's just say it's DOT's region one. They may interpret things a little bit differently than DOT region two. Uh, the Department of Labor's representative for the Knoxville area might interpret things a little bit differently than the Department of Labor's rep for region eight. So it's very important to stay in contact with your funding persons to make sure they're, you're meeting their expectations. Hope that helps some. The Copeland Act's main thing, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but the Copeland Act is part of the prevailing wage and related acts. Uh, the main thing was creative force to provide, prohibit kickbacks of pay that if you know the, the contractor would have to give somebody on the government a kickback or the workers have to give the contractor a kickback. But in the um, Davis-Bacon world that you will interact with primarily, hopefully there's no kickbacks, it requires certified weekly payrolls. No matter how frequently they pay their workers, they have to submit weekly payrolls to your agency. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but it, you are required to get weekly payrolls for the contractor and all subs. So it gets laborious if you're building um, a new school, new courthouse. I'll try to pick on different things. If you're building a new courthouse, you're probably going to hire a general contractor who will likely have an electrical sub, a masonry sub, a flooring sub, um, uh, HVAC sub, and drywall, and on and on. All of those have to submit certified payrolls to the GC, who then submits the whole package to you throughout the duration of the project. And we'll talk a little bit later about your, your role, our role uh, with certified payrolls. There's another question, yes. Terry. Go ahead. Um, regarding ARPA funding, when dealing with utility projects, do you look at 10 million per project or the total funding allocation? Most Davis-Bacon things are looked at per project because the prevailing wage rates are set per project. So my answer, semi-informed, is that it would be per project. Okay, and then um, there's a request to put the um, FAQs in the chat. When I mean, you could probably do that at the end of the thing. 
Yes, I will okay. work on that at the end. I, I probably would lose my screens if I tried to get them right this minute, and I'm hesitant to do that. Understood. <laughs> and please make this your meeting by interacting. That, that is great. So we'll talk about some of the major requirements, already alluded to some. So the first thing to understand is the federal government Department of Labor, which I will refer to as DOL, Department of Labor, surveys every county in the United States at least once a year to establish the wage classifications. And they survey contractors in the Knox County or in Montgomery County or in, in Sullivan County, all across the country. And then they use their responses to establish prevailing wages for different classifications throughout the country. Uh, then as needs arise, they may in, uh, resurvey in the middle of the year if they choose to, they being DOL, and they call those modifications. <clears throat> so in addition to establishing a minimum wage rate, for an HVAC technician, for instance, it also establishes any fringe benefit rate. And I'll show you an example here in a minute, but it might say an electrician is to be paid $32 an hour plus $5 in fringe benefits. And there is approved fringe benefits. Uh, you know, a contractor cannot just say, I let them use a desk, that's a fringe benefit. There's actually a list of, of fringe benefits. And then to keep it a little more complex, there are four types of construction. And we'll talk about those, but building, residential, highway, and heavy. And I'll give you some examples. You as the entity are responsible for posting at the job site or having your contractor or your AE firm or your project manager post at the job site that it's covered by Davis-Bacon. There's a sign you can download that directs them to DOL with any workers with any complaints, and then the copy of the wage rate determination. The, the language says something to the effect of most, must be posted in a prominent area accessible to all workers. It does not define that. The implication is it can't be in the foreman's glove box. But beyond that, uh, you know, you all have probably been by construction sites and saw billboards. That seems to be the general vision. So, which classification, residential, building, uh, highways, or heavy, which one do you use? It all depends on the character of the construction and the federal definitions of the four. A building, you use the building rates for things that are more than four stories, commercial buildings or buildings that don't store, don't house persons. Some examples are now on your screen if I did everything right. And typically for across this group, it would be courthouses, jails, um, fire stations, schools, subways, warehouses, and, and those kinds of things. Um, I'm not gonna read you 20 bullet points. You can read them yourself and you can find them online for that matter. But though typically most government governments will choose the building rates. <clears throat> Residential rates, are for apartment buildings four stories or less, things like married student housing at universities, multifamily homes, single family homes. Generally, it means somebody lives there. The office building I work in is one story, um, you know, but it would be classified as the building rate. So you can guess, by the way, those are the, probably the two most common, the building and residential. Building applies mostly to governments. Us housing authorities use a lot of residential, but generally governments are gonna use the building rates. Wanna guess which one has higher rates most of the time? If you guess building, that would be right. 
highways rate is for building roads. I mean, that one's pretty self-explanatory. And, and Michael, at the airport, it would include building runways, taxiways, but also a lot of us are putting in greenways, so it's trails, paths, and those kinds of things. <clears throat> and there's a whole bunch of examples. Uh, a lot of governments around the state do all or parts of these. Some of them, I don't even know what they mean, uh, but um, I can I can assume like a bridle path, I guess, is a horse path. I don't know. I should have looked that up. <clears throat> then we get to heavy, and it's the catch-all, and typically the most expensive rate of all. It is for things that cannot be classified as building, residential, or highway, and it's. Um, often is because of the particular project characteristics. Uh, you're, you're building a dam that's really unique. Uh, they're not that many built. Um, so I've never used one, but that is one of the more expensive ones. Some other examples of heavy. Just, excuse me for the Mountain Dew, but I keep going horse this morning. I see demolition. Is that all demolition? Even if it's a single story, whatever? It would depend on what you're demolishing. And the general rule is only if you're rebuilding. Gotcha. If, you're, if you're demolishing something in the heavy category. And I am circling my mouse like you could actually see what I was circling. So sorry about that. And then to really add to the complexity, you can also have what they call mixed determinations. And I'm sorry, I should have taken out the second bullet point. I thought I did actually, that only is a HUD thing. Um, but anyway, um, so on a really large project, we're redeveloping downtown Knoxville to make something up and it exceeds two and a half million, uh, one portion of it. Um, or 20%, we might have to have a multiple. So we're building, I'll make up an example. We tear down one of our public housing uh, projects. I'm not supposed to say that word, but projects. And we're rebuilding apartments, but we're also putting in a bridge and a highway. The bridge and highway might have to be given a heavy determination and, re and putting new apartments up would be the residential. And then, of course, the last bullet talks about how incidental things, if you're just putting a parking lot for the, for the new apartment building, that's probably not going to be mixed. We, we have another question. Sure. Um, improvements technology is very expensive. Is this covered under prevailing wages? Could you repeat the first part of that? Improvements technology is very expensive. Is this covered under prevailing wages? Only if it involves construction or major renovation. So if you're buying new servers and having them installed, no. If you're building a room to put your new servers in, yes. If you're buying 200 new laptops, no, unless you're building classrooms to put them in. Okay, and determination and classification are interchangeable terms? <laughs> a determination is based on the classification. If I can make this internet connection work, I think that'll clear that one up. Okay, yes. and yes, Terry's gonna share her slides with us. Oh, yes. Oh, we All got right. another one. If, sure. you are, if you are going to demolish a building and are rebuilding residential, would it be under heavy or under residential? You will need to check with your grantor, but in my experience, it would be the end result, which would be building residential. Thank you. So now I need to figure out how to shrink some stuff. So one second. So I need to get to the internet. So to find all of these, Hello, uh, someone probably needs to meet themselves. To find all of these things, you go to sam.gov. 
And can you still see my screen, by the way? Yes. Okay. And then you will search for wage determinations. Excuse me one second. I actually know what I'm doing. Then you will select Tennessee from the drop down. I'll just pick Knox because that's the one I'm most familiar with. And then you pick your construction type. Uh, and the DBA is Davis Bacon Act construction type. And let's just start with residential. And we want active and there it is. So here's the name, the TN2022022. So this is the residential, which is typically the cheapest, <clears throat> least expensive rates. And it gives you all kinds of interesting information or perhaps not, tells you which the previous decision was. And this one is interesting because it's always Knox and Anderson counties. Sometimes they're for one county, sometimes they're for multiple counties. It gives you the definition, residential, consisting of single family homes and apartments up to and including four stories. It will give you stuff about presidential orders. Please, please, please check with your granting authorities, but uh, being HUD funded, I have checked with HUD, the presidential minimum wage acts and sick leave acts, I have been told by HUD do not apply. Uh, oh, and by the way, I kept that email, I converted it to Adobe so it doesn't get deleted with the archives. And I would suggest you do when you verify things, because an auditor may ask you five years from now, your email may purge yearly. So you may want to consider saving it somehow. But in my world, none of the special things like executive orders apply. So I scroll down. And you can see this particular classification determination was modified uh, last in February. It was, it was published in January, and then they modified it in February, which means they updated it. So if I was doing, if I was going to do a bid today, I'm going to incorporate these classifications and rates in the in the bid because the contractors have to pay. A bricklayer is twelve seventy two, at a minimum, with no fringe benefits, and so on. For electrician, is typically one of the highest, eighteen fifty two, with two dollars thirty two cents in approved benefits. You will notice, um, for instance, that there is no HVAC worker on this one. There seldom is, by the way. That does not mean that your contractor can just not do it. They have a process, Department of Labor has a process. You, as the person getting the federal money, have to submit a request to add an HVAC worker if your general contractor needs one. I do not see a flooring contract, flooring installer, so you will have to request it. The process is your general contractor puts it on letterhead, requests it from you, you submit it. Uh, possibly with a form, depending on who's funding it, you submit it to Department of Labor. I used to, part of my spiel used to be that you would, you would um, submit it to the Department of Labor, and then by the time you're retired, they would respond. But they have changed. In the last year, they have gotten very, very responsive. When I have submitted in the last six months, I usually have a reply within two weeks. Uh, so I, I really give them kudos. And it's all done electronically now. And I think I share the email and the slides, but if not, I will. So that is the entire residential rate for Knox County right now. And that's what I would publish if I had to do a bid. And that's what the contract would be held to plus any they need to add. And we'll talk more about that later. Let me just show you the, um, 
building rate, and then we'll move on. The building rate is very similar format, tells you which one was superseded, gives you the definition. Building construction does not include single family homes or apartments up to four stories, only Knox County. If you're in Davidson County, you would have pulled Davidson County instead of Knox. If you're in Blunt, you would pull Blunt. Um, same kind of things about federal. This one has been modified five times since January. Looks like almost every month has been modified. It is a lot longer and the rates are higher. And you can see I'm still scrolling and I'm not gonna read all of these to you, but the building rates tend to be much more inclusive and you tend not to have to ask for as many additions as you can guess since I just scrolled three pages. Um, but you can also see some of the differentiation an asbestos worker, which wasn't even on the other one, with heat and frost insulators are due $33.25 an hour plus a whopping, whoa, $17.22 an hour. So you're, what, over $50 an hour for that person. Um, an electrician, and we'll talk about this one in a minute. I have an example. Sometimes, typically on building, they have an hourly rate, they have a percentage, and a dollar rate. So this person is going to be getting way over $40 an hour, and I'll, I'll show you the example. But this is much different, much more stuff. Uh, operators is an interesting one. The federal government, if there's going to be a, somebody on the job doing bobcat work, they get paid $16.84, but a person running a forklift only has to be paid $15, and a roller, which I think de deals with paving, is $14.35 an hour. So on the certified payrolls, if it's applicable, your GC is going to list all these different kinds of operators. So hopefully I didn't give anybody a heart attack, but... Um, that's, that's those in a nutshell. Now, let me see if I can get everything back the way it should be. All right, any questions so far, Camille? Yes, let me get to it. Does the contractor use the rates in effect at the beginning of the project or should they be changing the rates as the publication is updated? Excellent question, and, and thank you. I think I discussed it, but we'll discuss it now. There is a rule for that. Uh, it's within, as long as you sign the final contract within 90 days of bid opening, you use whatever you published. It's considered locked in. Now, if you enter extensive negotiation period and it's greater than 90 days, you as the agency may have to go back and look at, see if there is a newer release. And in such case, you would have to enforce that one. But most of us usually get things done within a reasonably short period of time. So here's the example about the confusing electrician one. This is not the same one. I copied this actually out of something else, but you can see the classification is an electrician but only for low voltage. So there would be, in this example, there would be another electrical rate for high voltage. But this one is low voltage only, 32.96 an hour. Um, and the way that works out, you start with your base rate of 32.96. You have the fringe of $8.10. In this example, the the percentage is 11% of the base rate, which comes out to 36256. So the electrician has to either be paid 3296 an hour plus that much in benefits, or they can be paid 4469 an hour. This is why the difference between residential and building is why it's really important to choose the right one. Let's say that Terry was asleep the day you put this bid spec together and we were building a high rise, but I published the residential rates as part of the specification. The contractor gives us a bid based on residential and then six months into the project, I wake up or Department of Labor wakes me up and says, oh, no, no, 
This is the commercial building rate. Somebody in that example has to then enforce the higher rates, but we already have a signed bid for the lower rates. Guess who's going to eat that? That would be the government, most likely. That is how, when it gets to the percentages, that's how you determine how it applies. Some of the local government's responsibilities are you have to have enforcement staff. Now, I have been told, and I think this is true throughout the federal government, while we have to enforce, it's more of review. We are not the FBI. We are not the IRS. We are not the inspector general. So if if Camille is reviewing a certified payroll and sees something peculiar, you can do a lot, you should do a low key inquiry to the vendor. Wow, you only have laborers working. You have no electricians, no HVAC, no carpenters, everybody's a laborer. So would you recheck that? But ultimately you're not the policeman, you're not the IRS, you're not the Department of Labor. If the contractor came back and said, oh no, I only hire laborers for this project, didn't need any electricians, you would consider reporting that to the Department of Labor for their review, but, um, but you would question it. You must have a construction contract management system to track the payrolls, and you must make sure your bid documents, contracts, subcontracts contain the federal labor standards clauses and the applicable wage decision. I will belabor this point a little bit because it has happened to me in the last 17 years that the general contractor seems to understand Davis-Bacon prevailing wages, and then some subcontractor doesn't think they apply. The drywall insulating subcontractor, well, I don't have to do Davis-Bacon, that's with the general contractor. you got a problem because they do. It flows down to all of the all of the subs. Terry, you have to, yes. I'm so sorry. We have a couple of questions. Oh, no, that's great. Uh, if a person does different jobs throughout the project, do they get different pay rates at different times? Yes. If the um, if the employer can accurately track the hours they spend as an electrician, as a laborer, as an HVAC. If not, uh, and I need to cross check myself, but I'm almost positive it's in the slides, by the way. If not, you have to put, they have to pay them the highest rate. They may not want to keep a stopwatch and say, I spent two hours and 12 minutes as a laborer, five hours as a forklift driver, five hours as an electrician. They may not want to, they may not have the capacity and therefore they have to pay the highest. And then um, we have someone asking, are you familiar with LCP Tracker as a software for payroll, et cetera? Yes, there are two or three approved software packages that you can subscribe to which are wonderful. We've done it on a few of our bigger projects. I mean, there is a fee and you pay it one way or the other. If you make the contractor pay it, you're paying it indirectly, but that gets rid of the need for paper certified payrolls. And a bigger contractor may well be happy to, to foot the cost because it makes it easier for them too. Uh, I have used that and we, we did not use that particular one. We used one called, um, yes, um, Elations, E-L-A-T-I-O-N-S, and it was wonderful. Unfortunately, we often are in such a tight budget, we generally don't afford those, but that was so nice. The vendor upload, the contractor uploads, the subs upload, you can see it on your computer screen. And I think that one gave us a check mark if everything matched as far as the rates. Um, so yes, but you can all, there may be many, I don't know, there may be many programs out there, but only a few are DOL approved. And to be DOL compliant, Department of Labor compliant, you have to use one of the approved ones. And, and how would you find out which ones are approved? I'm sure it's on DOL's webpage somewhere. They have 
Uh, one thing the federal government does pretty well is they have rather informative web, page, web pages. And um, they have several web pages devoted to Davis Bacon and related acts, tons of information. If you think I'm boring you, wait till you read theirs. Um, but um, it should be there. If not, if you can't find it, email me, I'll look it up. I probably have it somewhere, to be honest. And I think I have belabored this slide enough. We'll move on. So you do not have all of the responsibility. You have plenty. Your agency has plenty. But the contractor is responsible for the compliance concerning his or her employees and all the subs. The subcontractors communicate through the prime. So <clears throat> on the residential example I gave you, there was not, or I showed you, there was not a classification for an HVAC worker. So the I'll pick on Merit Construction. I always pick on Merit. So they have hired McKee HVAC services. So when Merit shows them the Davis-Bacon requirements, McKee HVAC is immediately going to see there's no HVAC installer, there's no HVAC tech, there's no HVAC mechanic. And HUD does delineate those pretty far down. It's not just HVAC tech. They have different definitions. So in my example, McKee HVAC then submits a request to the GC to add an HVAC installer at X dollars. They send that to Merit Construction, who reviews it and sends it to KCDC, who reviews it, perhaps a few things, and sends it off to the Department of Labor. And um, basic stuff there that um, the, you know, typical contractor responsibilities, all the flow down stuff. <clears throat> and then it's the same for the subs. They have to do their part. The last bullet point on that page <clears throat> is important. Both the general contractor and the subs must allow your representative to go on site and do employee interviews. <clears throat> These are not like hiring interviews. They can be quite brief. Um, HUD has a form. Uh, and I'm sure DOL has a form. DOT probably has a form. Department of Education probably has a form to guide you. Um, you know, but basically, you ask for um, uh, employee name, what they do. You write some observations, like what tools they use, and we'll talk about how important tools of the trade is, and you ask them their wage. Now, through the years, I've experienced some things that appear that on first blush that the contractor is lying on the certified payrolls. They put down, we're paying them $16 an hour, but when, and I don't, I've never personally gone out and done an interview, but when Gene, who works for me, has gone out and done interviews, the, the HVAC guy says, I'm, I get $12 an hour. So then when I compare that to the certified payroll, it's like, well, something's wrong. The contractor says he's paying 16, which is the minimum. The worker says he got 12. So then you have a responsibility to ask about that, find out what's going on, because if they're lying, you got a big problem. If the contractor is lying, what is the expl explanations that have been most common in my experience his normal, that worker's normal wage is $12 an hour. But on this particular project, because it's federally funded, they are being paid 16. And the worker just told you his normal rate. And, and then you, we had to get, again, contact your granting agency, but we had to get affidavits. And I don't mean in front of a court, but we got signed statements from both saying, yes, I am paid 16 and I'm not being coerced. Uh, just to part with the certified payrolls to, to um, document for the auditors. And here's the lock-in provision that somebody asked about. As long as you award within 90, we're good. If, uh, if DOL, Department of Labor, publishes a change less than 10 days before the bid opening, and you don't have time to notify your bidders, <clears throat> then it, you do not have to change. 
but usually that's never happened with me. I will note just for hopefully useful point, typically they change these in January. So don't have any bid openings in early January if you can help it. <clears throat> On the other hand, that was a formal bid, publicly bid project. If some reason you're negotiating contracts, the rule's a little different. Um, let's say it's a sole source emergency construction over 2000. You look at the contract award date or the construction start date, whichever occurs first is your lock-in date. I've not had that experience personally. Okay, adding classifications. Um, so you've determined in my example, there's no HVAC worker. You cannot ask for one if it's already on there, by the way, they get a little irritated. Um, and that's actually happened. Um, so it has to have a reasonable relationship. They call it the reasonable, reasonable relationship standard. If you're asking for a painter, and, and the general contractor wants to pay them $8.50 an hour, but the laborer is being paid $9 an hour, they're not going to approve it. If you're asking for an electrician at $20 an hour and the plumber is being paid $40 an hour, they're not going to approve it, they being Department of Labor. You also generally, again, depending on the funding father, want some sort of statement on, on the contractor's letterhead that they've discussed the proposed rate with their employee and they agree. Um, so um, you have the right, well, you do not have the right to refuse to send a contractor's request to the Department of Labor, but you have the right to tell the contractor, there's no way this is gonna be passed, would you reconsider? And I've done that numerous times. 99% of the time they, they changed it, but ultimately you have to present, if they want to go for it, you present it. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and then conformances are, um, there are certain, classifications, and I don't think I've prepared any slides, but there are several things, for instance, that are somewhat related to carpentry, and you can semi-automatically use a carpenter rate for those. And I cannot think of any off the top of my head, of course, but I, I think perhaps um, a carpet layer might be one. I have them in a book back there, but I'm not going to get the book out and waste your time looking it up. So there are some times you can conform them without sending them off to the Department of Labor. Your contractors cannot borrow. Uh, in the, I showed you two examples, the residential rate and the building rate. Residential didn't have HVAC, the building rate did. Your contractor cannot just say, eh, I'll pull the one from, H, from the building rate and we'll just use that. That is not permissible. Um, you, and they must, you must require it. Just because it's not there does not mean you cannot. Oh, and there's the email address you email your request to. Uh, typically, it's some sort of letter format. Here's the bid name. Here's what they're doing. Uh, and we need a painter added, and we're the contractor is proposing X dollars an hour. And then depart you email it. And as I said, right now, they're very prompt, and you'll get back a formal letter, you know, I'm sure it's computer generated, and it will say we approved it, we disapproved it, or we approve it, but at a higher rate than you asked for, or they may send back questions. Uh, one of my recent ones was for a flooring installer, and Department of Labor sent back and wanted to know what kind of flooring they were installing. And they wanted to know by tomorrow, uh, literally, I'm not making that up. I think I got the email around noon and they wanted it by close of business the next day. So the contractor had to scramble to get with his subcontractor to give me an answer to get back to Department of Labor. But good news, Department of Labor liked what they sent and they approved it the second day. So um, those are their options. 
So some essential concepts about uh, Davis-Bacon. <clears throat> Under Davis-Bacon and related acts, the rule is persons are classified and paid for the work they perform, not according to titles, experience, or skill level. Department of Labor does not care whatsoever what job title merit construction gives people. I have actually had construction firms say, well, I call my electricians, their official job title is a um, skilled laborer. And therefore, according to the list you gave me, Terry, they should only have to be paid this much lower rate. And the answer is, we do not care what you call them. And that's for obvious reasons. If, if, if they could call them all custodians, then nobody would even be covered by Davis-Bacon. They also do not care that they're an electrician one, or electrician two, electrician three. They're an electrician. And then the really important part is the tools used. I have had person companies say, well, he's a laborer. Well, then why is he carrying a voltage meter? Why is he installing breaker boxes? Why is he uh, licensed by the city of Knoxville as an electrician? Why is he using an electric drill? Uh, you know, he's not a laborer, he's an electrician. Well, this is a laborer, he just happens to paint, Terry. Is he using a roller and a sprayer? And is he carrying around gallons of paint and opening them, opening them and, and using them? Then he is a painter. Um, you may have those kinds of arguments with folks. I, looks like there might be a question, Camille. Yes. Is there a difference for an electrician apprentice than for just an electrician? No, unless they're enrolled in a federally recognized apprenticeship program. A lot of the uh, major crafts have apprentices, journeymen, uh, master sometimes, but the Department of Labor rules are you're an electrician unless you're enrolled in a approved, federally approved apprenticeship program. Gets back to the titles. And just a parenthetical note, generally, when I tell contractors they have to enforce XYZ rates, they laugh and say, I wish I could get somebody for that little, that small of a rate. I mean, it's typically not a big issue in my experience. The site of the work matters. If you're buying um, Clayton Homes, you're buying some modular buildings from Clayton Homes, they're built off site. It's like buying pencils from Staples in, in, in a sense. I'm sure Clayton would slap me, but it is not made on your site. So Davis-Bacon only applies to laborers and mechanics on the site of work. So if they assemble a shed for you and it's a $5,000 shed and all they do is deliver it, it's probably not going to apply to Davis-Bacon. <clears throat> ah, apprentices, see, you, you all keep reading my mind. Apprentices and trainees, they must be registered in the Department of Labor. You, uh, while Davis-Bacon doesn't apply, you are expected to get some sort of proof such as registration or apprentice agreement. Uh, and they will have ratio language in them, by the way, that there'll be one apprentice per two electricians or, or something. Um, if, they're, if they're using 15 apprentices and one electrician, more than likely you're gonna have to pay them the full rate because the ratio wouldn't be right. Helpers are generally um, not allowed. I've had that happen a lot. Well, he's a helper, she's a helper. Well, what do they do? Well, they pretty much do the same thing as an electrician, carpenter. Well, then they're a carpenter. Well, they're, they're a junior, they're a carpenter. So you would normally not accept that on a certified payroll. It gets complex if it's an owner operator. Um, if they might be considered exempt if they own at least 20%, and they're actively engaged in the management of the business. 
But even if they have 20% ownership, but they're out running the bulldozer every day, they're out installing all the meter boxes, installing HVAC ducts, then they're covered. The real bottom line is, are they true management or not? And, and, and it gets complex. I've had arguments with vendors uh, and it's usually a real small firm, uh, but that is Department of Labor's bottom line. <clears throat> when they turn in a certified payroll, by the way, um, someone has to, someone in authority to represent the company has to certify that it's a true and valid certified payroll. What's on the information is accurate, subject, <clears throat> subject to the penalty of law. Except if they're self-employed, they can't certify their own because that would be obviously um, sus suspect. So they would have to um, find someone else to do it for them. I have not personally experienced that. And someone asked about this earlier. Excuse the rudeness of drinking in front of you, but I keep going with Barry Horse. And I think this probably says it better than I babbled earlier. But yes, if they do multiple jobs, as long as they can track exactly how much time they spend on each one, they can be paid split scales. Otherwise, you pay them the highest. Surveying is a weird, quirky thing. Um, if they're doing surveying is somewhat covered by Davis-Bacon, but if they're part, if, if my part of being a surveying team is measuring distances or reading instruments, that's considered professional, so my work wouldn't be covered. But um, if I'm part of the surveying crew and I'm cleaning brush and setting up mechanical stuff for, for the professional to read, I'm probably covered. I have had extremely limited experience, but that is what the rules are. Harry? Yes. Could you go back and readdress what the owner is, what the owner means? So the owner has to have at least 20% ownership and very importantly, and to be actively engaged in managing the business. So an example of what would not qualify, I happen to own 20% of um, a drywall company, but my day-to-day -day activity, I'm not really managing it. I'm installing drywall. So you would not be considered an owner. On the other hand, if I own 21% and I primarily make management decisions, I hire employees, I set our policies, I bid on jobs, I do very minimal uh, actual installation, then I would be exempt from Davis-Bacon. Hopefully that helps some. Yes, thank you. Is there another one now, Camille? No, Terry just said thank you. <laughs> there is truly tons of information online. I'm not necessarily giving you a two-page definition of all of these, um, and the feds are prone to two or three-page definitions, and no offense, but um, so, you know, if you, if you want extreme details, go to dol.gov, and you can find it. And again, I probably have it. Just email me sometime. Truck drivers gets also confusing. If it's Home Depot Pro delivering some stuff to the site and somebody offloads it, they're, you know, they're delivering um, drywall, that, that's not covered. Now, if it's a really big project and it's, say it's a dump truck moving dirt from the lower 40 acres all day to the upper 40 acres, that's probably going to be covered because that's on the site of work and it is material. <clears throat> So as long as it's de minimis, they're dropping off some office supplies, they're dropping off some more hard hats, they're dropping off um, rafters or something that's not, it's not covered. In my, again, in my experience, for what that's worth, um, it, it's not been an issue. It's never, I've never had to cover a truck driver um, that I recollect. Now that I'm saying that, I'm self-doubting, but um, I don't think I have. 
And there are classifications, by the way, for dump trucks. And those get subdivided by how many axles, axles that is, four or fewer, five or more, and the rates go up depending on the size. So if you're building a road, for instance, you would have a truck driver classification that would matter because they'd unload tons of rock and asphalt on the site. And I'm just moving along. Um, pay issues. Um, workers had to be paid weekly, which is common in construction anyway. They have to be paid the wage rate specified or more. And you have to post, I think I actually talked about all of these. Um, once a work week is established, it should not change during your construction project. So if, if for that general contractor, if their work week begins on a Sunday and ends on a Saturday, that's the way it needs to be throughout the project. If their work week starts on Friday and ends on Thursday, it needs to be that way throughout the project. Piecework can get contentious. Uh, flooring installers are sometimes piecework. They get paid so much per square yard, for instance, or per square foot, I guess. So um, they have to, they're not exempt from, from doing it. They have to convert it to an hourly wage for the certified payroll, which is the total weekly wages, however they get paid, whatever basis they get paid on per square, per foot, whatever, divided by the hours worked, and that gives you the effective hourly wage, and that has to equal or exceed the Davis-Bacon. <clears throat> Fringe benefits. They have to be bona fide, a good legal phrase, and they have to be in certain things, and they cannot be revocable. Um, you know, I can decide not to do, a, and I'm being silly, but I can decide not to give you a Christmas bonus this year because that is revocable. It is not a fringe benefit just because the contractor says it is. <clears throat> fringe benefits do not include anything required by law. So that is already ruled out. The fringe benefit is not unemployment compensation. It is not um, workers' comp. <clears throat> and on the certified payroll, there, there is a form, by the way, that DOL has. It is optional, but if, the, if a contractor does not use the DOL form, theirs has to provide all the same information. But on, on the Department of Labor form, they have to check whether or not fringe benefits are paid. And then I think I mentioned earlier that the prevailing wage requirements can be met by a combination of cash, well, wages, and creditable bona fide benefits in any combination thereof. My experience, a lot of contractors, the majority, just use the, the wages and don't do much with the fringe benefits. And a wonderful chart. You can see the typical fringe benefits that Department of Labor recognizes without quibbling on the left. Or I guess it's, it's my left, I assume it's your left. But they recognize life insurance, health insurance, sick leave, um, true vacation type stuff, holidays and pension plans, as long as they're funded. Uh, workers' comp unemployment, social security is mandated by law. Uh, giving them a Thanksgiving turkey is nice, but that does not count. A company car and cell phone doesn't count as a fringe benefit. I've had that argument with vendors and they lose. You know, I will eventually, as I noted, if they won't agree with me, I'll refer it to Department of Labor and they lose. I mean, Department of Labor will reply, no, that is not a fringe benefit. And, and I don't want to sound like I've, you know, I, I do in 17 years, I've done hundreds of these. So it's not like every one of them has those kind of arguments. I don't want to leave that impression. <clears throat> part of the related acts and, and I mean, it's just normal stuff anyway but they have to be paid uh, overtime for all hours over 40 but they also have to be paid time and a half their regular pay plus any fringe benefits and one thing you should always note because this gets confusing to vendors contractors 
this is only for work they're doing on your project. So if they're building a new, um, whose face do I see? They're building a new town hall for Johnson City, but across the street, the same vendor is building a McDonald's. We don't care what they're paying across the street. It's, I always find it helpful to tell the vendor, this is only for KCDC projects because I've had them get all concerned about well, I'm permanently raising my employees rate. I can't pay them on every project I've got undergoing. No, it's just for this one project. And sometimes I've had employees try to file, well, once or twice, try to file a complaint saying I should be paid for all of my work. No, you should, well, you should be paid, but not the Davis-Bacon rates. And contractors, as I mentioned, have to some, so do the uh, certified payrolls. I already told you there's an optional form and there's the link for it. Um, and they should indicate the first payroll. They're, they're asked to number them, payroll number one. And then if it's a three-year project, it'd be payroll number 36, and they mark final by it. And if they take the week of Christmas off, generally it's a best practice to go ahead and get week five, no work, holiday week. Um, I'm not going to try again to pull up the form, but it's because I figure I'll screw something up in, in, in the Zoom or something, but uh, it's, a, it's on the DOL's webpage and it, it's pretty easy to use. I think they have a fillable Adobe nowadays, but your contractors do not have to use it, but I do suggest they do. Is there any question, Camille? More of a statement. Debbie says there is a McDonald's across from Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> How did I know that? Wow. Uh, it is important, and I know this sounds trite, but if you've ever tried, had the unfortunate experience to try to read my scribble, it is really important that payrolls be legible. I do not think they legally have to be typed, but they do have to be legible again, for your sanity, but also because an auditor, the inspector general, um, a citizen of the state of Tennessee could ask to see this three years from now. And if you couldn't read it in 2022, what are the odds you're gonna remember what it was supposed to mean in 2025? And I say that with all sincerity, my handwriting is the worst I've ever seen. I put doctors to shame with my scribble, so, um, you know, it's preferable if they'll type it or use the online system. The prime should be reviewing the subcontractor payrolls and you have to retain them for three years. Um, and I believe that I should know this. I think it's three years from the project completion. You'll need to cross check me on that. But, you know, if the project starts in 2022, but doesn't finish to 25, you would keep them all till 28. Uh, Pretty sure that's the, the rule. You um, should not, or nor should the general contractor punch holes in them, like to bind them. Uh, you should not have coffee stains on them or unidentifiable marks or ink smears. You're supposed to preserve them reasonably pristine. I do not know if this is what all departments, federal departments require, but HUD I haven't asked in quite a few years now, but HUD used to insist on that we kept originals and did not scan them. Um, so you may want to check guidance. And of course, if you use one of the software packages, that's not an issue. And I think I've covered this enough, but same requirements on the subs. Department of Labor no longer requires social security number on certified payrolls. Apparently many years ago before my time, they did, but the general contractor has to have that information in case some inspector, some auditor wants to see it. <clears throat> we have a question. Yes. Do you accept emailed copies or require a hard copy original of certified pay payrolls? The guidance I've always received is I had to have originals unless I was using the online software. We can talk privately sometime about some reality. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <clears throat> 
and the payrolls have to indicate wages and deductions and those kinds of things. Again, I don't think this is rocket science. You would be very concerned when you're reviewing certified payrolls if they started having huge deductions. You would have to wonder, is that some sort of kickback or really take back of wages? You know, you're, the vibe I get from various trainings is you're supposed to have a slightly suspicious mind mindset when you're reviewing these. But again, we are not policemen, not the IRS, not the Department of Labor. Um, we don't carry badges, or as far as I know, none of us do. But um, when the person, there is a signature required saying that it's true and valid and you know, no, no kickbacks and no um, coercion, you know, they're putting their name legally out there. So um, you would hope they take it seriously. Reviewing payrolls and the interviews, because as I mentioned, you compare your interviews to the certified payrolls to get a cross check. The rule of thumb is you, you interview an appropriate, how do they phrase it, a reasonable number of employees. So my rule of thumb has been when Gene, who works for me, goes out, if there's 10, HV, 10 workers, he's going to interview two. If there's three workers, he's probably going to interview all three so that they don't feel left out. If there's 100 workers, he's going to interview 10 or so, somewhere around 10 percent, unless he, unless we start seeing something peculiar. Um, and these are some help, helpful hints, hopefully, from Department of Labor. Interviews are confidential. It will not be directly shared with the general contractor. I would tell them the payroll, certified payroll doesn't seem to match certain employees' wages based on their interview, but you don't say Bob said and get Bob in trouble for something uh, that you didn't mean to. <clears throat> you do allow, if you do find something, you do reasonably ask the contractor what's going on, give them a reasonable time to make corrections, pay restitution, but you don't let it linger forever. You need to set a follow-up date and a closure date. There is a concept of restitution and that has happened to me. It's not uh, with vendors. It's not the end of the world. It's not like the vendor's going to jail or there's a federal class action lawsuit. Just means for whatever reason, apparently good faith, somebody was underpaid. You noticed it on the certified payroll or the interview or some combination. You tell, actually, we have one going on here now, and we itemized what the problem was, sent it back to the vendor, said, you now owe Bob, Jane, and Fred X more dollars, and submit proof that you paid it, such as a photostat, as they used to say, of a check stub or something, and have the, have the employee sign it. If you're HUD funded, there's a form you turn in twice a year, imagine that, and you document um, restitution on that form because they want to track to see if it's a big issue or not. You can also schedule additional employee interviews. I gave you my rule of thumb about 10% or so, but if we start seeing issues, I'll send Gene back out to do even more because I have some requirement to make sure things are seem reasonably accurate. Is that a new question, Camille? Yes. Can you provide clarity on how you calculate the fringe benefits? <laughs> Added to the basic rate, or do you apply it specifically to the items that are approved as fringe, as fringe benefits? An example would be a carpenter is $38. The fringe bene benefit is $34.72. Is the 3472 paid to a specific fringe benefit, specifically maybe life insurance, or is it factored into the basic rate as you shared in the previous slide? So the contractor has the right to do it either way. Um, my experience has been they typically mostly rely on the uh, hourly rate. If the combination is $50 an hour, they're typically, in my experience, they're going to pay them $50 an hour and be done with it. But they have a right to pay them, and, and I don't remember the particulars, but let's say 25 and 25, 25 fringe, 25 an hour. The contractor has a, <clears throat> has a right to pay them $25 an hour times 40 hours or 60 hours or whatever. 
and the value of approved fringe benefits equaling 25 an hour if they chose to do that. So they would have to calculate, let's say that I think life insurance was one of the approved ones. They would have to calculate the value of that life insurance policy, how much it costs per year, divide that up and see how much it's worth to that person per hour. And let's say that gives them a dollar of the 25, then they got 24 more dollars to go doing the same thing. Um, paid vacation, I think was one of them. So they would calculate the person's rate. They get eight out, um, 40 hours a year of, of paid vacation and do the math so that they have the right to do either or a combination. Well, I pay them 25 an hour and the benefit of, of um, life insurance adds another $3 an hour, and then I pay $22 in other fringe benefits if my math happens to be right off the top of my head. So they can pay the all of an hourly, they can pay the hourly and pay the fringe and true benefits or any combination thereof. If they're paying benefits, you need some documentation so that you can, with a straight face, say, yes, these are bona fide benefits that the Department of Labor will accept. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you need every detail about their insurance plan, but you need some assurance that it seems to be reasonable. Okay. Um, another, sorry, another question, are the interviews required even if you don't see the discrepancies? Yes, as, as far as I know that you are required to do a certain number, I think they phrase it reasonable number of interviews, because that's getting it from the employee perspective versus, if you will, the static paper that comes into you once a week with numbers and data on it. Um, I, as I sort of alluded, I've seen issues with rates. And again, nine, nine and a half out of 10, everything's pretty much accurate. But some examples I've seen are some rates that were wrong. And I didn't see anything nefarious. They were just wrong. Um, and titles, you know, they were listed on certified payroll as a laborer. This is a true example. But when Gene was out interviewing, oddly, they seemed to be doing the same thing a plumber did. They were bringing toilets from the truck, setting them and installing the toilets. But, but they were listed on the certifieds as a helper or, or not a helper, but a laborer. Well, the plumber's doing the exact same thing. So they're a plumber, they're not a, a laborer. So that, you know, it's a, a cross purpose. It's a cross check to make sure the certified payroll was accurate. Um, I will tell you that some employees are nervous um, or don't want to do it for whatever reason. Uh, they may think um, that you're a part of um, uh, immigration control, uh, to be honest. They may think you're a policeman. Um, I've heard not directly through my work, but I've heard from others about, you know, sometimes they think they're child support people trying to track them down for past due child support. They think you're FBI, CIA, TBI, whoever, you know, so sometimes there's a little nervousness, uh, but um, we've never had a big issue with that. But an issue it can be, particularly nowadays, is I'm pretty much uh, not bilingual. No one on my staff is bilingual. And a lot of our workers are uh, Hispanic. And we have had some issues with really not being able to communicate. And that gets interesting. Um, I remember one time on a really large project, we determined that was an issue. And we ended up hiring an interpreter to go with us uh, one day. You know, And these don't take all day. I mean, they're... they're 30 minutes typically or so, uh, not counting travel time. But we actually hired a, a local interpreter uh, because we didn't feel comfortable having the foreman type interpret for the obvious reasons they might not see fit to interpret correctly. We have think, two more yes. questions. Yes. Is there a general list of questions to ask in the interviews? Yes, and I, I don't have the HUD form pulled up, but it's basically things like name, um, title, what do you do, what tools do you use, what are you paid, 
I think your address, because if you have to track them back down, you sort of need the address. And we've had to do that a time or two, which is an interesting adventure. Um, and then there's a part of the, again, this is the HUD form, and I suspect other agencies have similar. Um, there's a place for the interviewer to put notes of things he or she observes. They were carrying toilets, they were installing pipe, they were using a welding machine. Um, and I think the interviewer is asked, what tools did you see them using? It's those kind of very rudimentary things. And the next is how does DB apply to internal maintenance personnel versus outside contract maintenance? Is that by chance from a housing authority? It's Kevin Pennington, I don't know. <laughs> um, there's a whole different rule. That's why I was asking. There's a whole different scenario for housing authorities. Um, so I, I didn't really prepare to address that. There are, um, in, and I can only really speak in broad terms on that one, irrespective of whether it's a housing authority or not. I have the info, but I don't have it at the top of my head. There are requirements that if you're using a federal grant and your people are doing the construction work, the feds typically call that, and this was an interesting concept for me to grasp, they call it forced labor. I had a whole different connotation on that when I came here, but the forced labor account is your own employees doing work with federal money. And there are certain requirements uh, that I am not at this moment prepared really to, to elaborate, but it, because I'd have to go read it again, but it does require the payment of certain minimum wages, uh, not in the typical minimum wage stuff. Uh, for instance, in housing authorities, the HUD, the Housing and Urban Development Department in conjunction with the Department of Labor issues us, or, and I think MDHA is on here, they also get HUD determined maintenance wage rates. HUD and Department of Labor look at the prevailing wages and certain other factors. And they tell us that our electricians have to make this and our laborers have to make that and so on. But it's not part of the normal Davis-Bacon. And if you understood that, you're much more brilliant than I am. But there is some requirements. And if you'll contact me later, I can help guide you to a sensible answer. My apologies for not having it at the tip of my tongue. So on, on um, and hang in, we're, we're coming fairly near the end unless you have lots of questions. Classification, um, one of the things you look at is the, ra the relative ratio of, of like of laborers versus skilled, because laborer is always the least paid, typically, well, I shouldn't say always, but mostly. So if they're building a brand new uh, swimming pool for the city of X, um, and there's 15 people on the certified payroll, and only one is some sort of skilled person, you've got to wonder, why is 99% of their workers, unskilled labor, getting a much lower rate? So you are expected to think through those kind of things. If they're incomplete, um, they, you know, they're building you a brand new courthouse and there's only three people on the certified payroll, you're expected to think, does that seem reasonable that three people are building a $20 million courthouse? So you're expected to do Yes, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, if there's routine painting of vacant units or landscaping that's over 2,000, um, would that be considered being paid at the Davis bacon rates? That really sounds like that's a HUD related question. And it would probably <laughs> be your um, HUD determined maintenance wage rates. So um, HUD will send you, of course, a lot of housing authorities have converted to a different HUD funding model and it doesn't necessarily apply. We no longer have to do that because all of our properties except one have converted. I'll try to make this brief so everybody else isn't bored. But if you're a traditional housing authority under the what HUD calls a um, public, well, I'm just gonna say traditional public housing, they will issue you every supposedly every year doesn't always happen but they'll issue you yearly 
uh, determine maintenance wage rates. So there'll be painter, HVAC, whatever. And then they also issue you, I think they call it extraordinary maintenance wage rates, something like that for big maintenance projects. Uh, and then you are bound to use those rates. And then if you contract it out, this gets really complex and it probably depends on which HUD person you talk to. But if you bid it out, you're expected to enforce those rates on your contractor. Um, and our former HUD person, her name was Deborah, she required that they submit monthly reports certifying that they paid whatever those rates were that we dutifully scanned and stored for no real reason. But I better move along, don't get my mouth in trouble. Uh, did I, are there more questions at this second, Emil? No. Good deal. And I already really talked about this. Um, you may get a complaint uh, and it, from a worker and it may or may not be valid. 17 years, I've probably gotten three, maybe, maybe not even three. But sometimes they talk to fellow carpenters doing a different federal job, federally funded job, or they talk to each other and one of them is being paid 15 an hour and the other one's being 12, paid 12 an hour on the same job. If a, if a worker sends you a complaint, you have an obligation to explore it. Again, we're not policemen, police women, but you have to look into it to some degree. Um, one of the three, if, if I've had three, one of the three was from a painter's union out of Chattanooga uh, who saw fit to hire an attorney to come chat with us. Because, well, this one's really peculiar and I, I won't linger, but they, this was when Tennessee had more prevailing wage. Now it's pretty much Tennessee, the state just reinforces it on road work, public roads, but they used to actually have requirements but we never, here, we never received state funds, but the state wage rate at the time was higher than federal and they were threatening to sue us because we weren't paying the state mandated wage rate. And, you know, the, their balloon burst when we met with them, uh, they're a high priced attorney and said, well, we have no state funds, so you have no complaint, have a good day. But anyway, you may get complaints and you have some obligation to review them. Documentation, anything federal documentation is very important. You do have an obligation to take corrective actions to some degree again. Um, and if it's significant, you need to notify your funding source and Department of Labor. Uh, general contractors, subcontractors have an appeals right. I should have mentioned this earlier. So actually on a wage determination, when you print that off and put it in your bid spec or you copy it into your bid spec as the case may be, um, you can see they don't look really nice. So I choose to retype mine so they stay consistent with my bid specs. But one of the requirements is okay, that- Oh, um, uh, is this the one that the- um, The daisy? Yes. Um, you might want to mute yourself. <laughs> So uh, one of the requirements on yeah, wage, one of the requirements on a wage determination, it does say they if a general contractor disagrees, um, basically you're disagreeing with the federal statisticians, but if you disagree with their rates they have compiled, there's an address you can send your complaint to in Washington, and they do have that right. And they also have a right to appeal if you tell them that. Bob does the work of an electrician and carries the same tools. We think he should be an electrician. They can appeal that to the Department of Labor. If you're doing sound judgment, they're probably going to lose, but they do have that right. And you should know that. And I should have mentioned it earlier. I've never had that occur. Of course, we're, in honesty, we've not had that many issues out of the grand scheme of life of Davis Bacon. I should have mentioned earlier, you get a certified payroll in and you notice something peculiar on it or something doesn't make sense, you don't throw it away. There, the federal expectation is you keep it, then you get corrected payroll for week five and you put it with the original week five and make sure it's um, 
accurate. <clears throat> you want some sort of assurance from the contractor that they understand now, they won't do it again. And you may want that as some sort of certification. There are liquidated damages as part of the, for overtime violations as part of the related acts part. You can see it's $10 per day per violation. Um, and there's, I've not experienced that so far. I mean, overtime is pretty standard in the, in the United States. Oh, and there's links to the Department of Labor's uh, Davis-Bacon Related Acts homepage and various forms, posters, and e-tools. And they truly do a good job putting information up there for you to download, contractors to download, workers to download. <clears throat> and then at the same place, by the way, that you look for Davis-Bacon wage decisions, uh, the GSA's debarment list is there. And of course, you're not supposed to award any federally funded projects until you make sure they're not debarred from the federal government. And the implication is, by the way, you would not award to them in addition to the federal debarment if they're state debarred or city of Johnson City debarred if you're in that area. Um, so I always check the state debarment. And of course, the state requires the Iranian debarment check and now the Israeli um, Discrimination Act check if it's over a quarter million dollars, I think. And guess what? You hung out all the way to the end with me, and I appreciate it. <clears throat> Any other questions? I just want to remind you of the FAQs, if you haven't uh, watched that. That was the ARPA FAQs. So let me see if I can figure out once again how to shrink this. And um, hopefully everyone saw Lori's comment. If you're sharing a computer, please reach out, let us know, let Lori know. <clears throat> Terry, we thank you so much. I've it was my pleasure. Learned and something. I Hopefully, I didn't bore everyone to death. No, sir. Well, not me. <laughs> um, when I get the slides from Terry and uh, get the um, recording um, done, I'll send out an email with the with the link for both of those. Um, Karen Smitherman also provided me with a. Uh, form that she uses for interviews, and I will send that as well. Um, so that uh, those those things will be coming for those for those of you that are on this call. So uh, that's all. Uh, I do see I see a question, Terry. Sure. Can you confirm that Davis Bacon is not applicable to ARPA funds? If you'll, I just posted the FAQ and hopefully the right one I quickly searched, but it does say in there that it does not apply as long, but at $10 million project for infrastructure, they do strongly urge them um, or something similar. They are not man, technically not mandating that you use it, but they are suggesting it because they want well, you know, they have their political language in there, but uh, um, so yeah, look in the FAQ, but that is what I have found through the last couple of years, that ARPA is one of the many exceptions to the so-called uniform guidance. Uh, Penny Owens and I laugh a lot about the so-called uniform guidance because it's full of exceptions uh, and uh, it's a attempt at uniform guidance, but Apparently, Congress chose to specifically not require prevailing wage on the ARPA money. But as I said at the very beginning, I am not your auditor. I'm not your granting agency. I'm not your attorney. So please, please research me. And even though it might sound like I have a whole bunch of trivia in my head about Davis Bacon, and I do, there are truly books written about it. There are learned attorneys that specialize in it. So I know what I know. I hate to give too many disclaimers, but I know what I know, and I, you know, I, I cannot speak to everything because um, I'm an insecure person. What can I say? So.
Uh, and if your ARPA money is actually ESSER money, which is the school's version yes. of ARPA, your Davis-Bacon is required for those. So. Yeah, another wonderful exception. Um, always get to know your granting authority well. I have not dealt with ESSER. I might have a little bit when I was with the school system. Don't remember. It's been so long. It may not have existed back then. So. It's brand new. <laughs> I did not. E-rate was the thing that we had back when I was there. Um, uh, so yes, and that's uh, thank you for bringing that up, Lori, because it takes us all talking and communicating. Uh, you know, I, I was obviously woefully ignorant of of ESSER, uh, so uh, it really does take us all interacting and and do, using TAPS um, chat features and NIGPs uh, to to help each other out. Uh, yes, we will be getting those slides and sending them to everyone. With let me write, let me write that down so it will actually happen. <laughs> I know myself. It's not written down. It's probably not going to happen. Well, thank you all again. If, if you're done, I'm done. But I'm, I can hang out a few minutes if anybody has questions. Doesn't look like it. Good deal. Email, email Terry. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Terry, real quick, are you familiar with the required paperwork? I know that um, ARPA is not dictating Davis Bacon, but are you familiar with the required paperwork that must be submitted um, with with projects that are you know have the ARPA funds in there? I'm not sure that you have to actually submit it. I think they just want you to have it in case, and again, check me, because we're not, our agency is not directly getting ARPA money, so I've not explored it uh, to a great oh, deal. Okay. My okay. understanding is you're supposed to retain those in case they want them. Okay, okay. And what about the Buy America, the B? Um, uh, yes. So I think that is required. Excuse me, I'm reaching for a cheat sheet here that I happen to have. Um, the Buy America, actually, Buy America does not apply to ARPA, except I don't, now that you asked me, I'm really doubting that answer, but it is what my chart says. But I would have sworn President Biden made a concerted effort to encourage buying American iron and steel. I'm going to research that one and we'll send an actual answer when I send the slides to Lori. Because I, okay. I am doubting my chart now, even though it clearly says no, but I'm doubting it. Okay, that'll be great. And then I owe you all of our documents too that I'm gonna send you, so yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. That, that chart sounds intriguing, Terry. Okay. Do you share it? Sure. Okay. Adding it to the list. <laughs> I actually prepared it for some other workshop I've done along the way. Probably one penny and I did. <clears throat> and it tries to differentiate between general federal funds versus ARPA uh, to, to see, because there are some variances. <clears throat> Anybody else? Thank you all for attending. Really do appreciate that. All this information will go out as soon as we're able <laughs> and have it. <laughs> and happy Thanksgiving all. You too, Terry, and everyone else. Working.